So when World War II started in 1939, it was barely 20 years since the Great War. And in that time, the development for pilots and aircrew equipment came on leaps and bounds, as did the aircraft. And we can see that with the P-51D here. So what was it that American pilots wore during World War II? Well, stay tuned, because we'll take an in-depth look at the flying equipment used by pilots of the United States Army Air Forces when they were flying fighters, just like this one behind me. So, back in 1944, what I'm wearing now is what every United States Army Air Force officer would have worn while on duty at their home base. So starting from the top, we've got the 50 Mission Crusher cap. Now these were a variant of the standard officer service cap, but being the United States Army Air Force, typically pilots and aircrew like to add a little bit of flair. So what they would do, they would take it out there was a, a hat band around the rim of the, uh, the green cloth. If they took that out, it would crush down because the material is quite thin, um, especially when, or if headphones were worn over the top. But what some hat companies did was then start to make these specifically look like crushed caps. So that's what I'm wearing there. Then my jacket, that is the iconic A2 leather flying jacket. Now this was a pre-war design that carried through for most of World War II for American um, Air Force aircrew. However, toward the latter stages of the war, the Americans realizing that leather was becoming uh, not really a scarce resource, but they could make it cheaper and they could make um, possibly warmer jackets. They then started to develop the uh, B10 series of jackets and then the B15 um, through to war's end. But ultimately it's the iconic United States Army Air Force um, United States Army Air Corps jacket from World War II as worn by pilots of both fighters and bombers. Then underneath you've got the uh, well-known pinks and greens. So wearing the green shirt with the uh, um, rank on it and also the Air Corps insignia on the collar um, covered off with a tie. And then going down you've got the pinks trousers which were um, iconic uh, for American forces during World War II. So much so, in fact, that recently the United States Army actually brought them back into circulation as their dress uniforms. And I think that's one of the best moves the US Army has done in years because it looks so cool. Another important uh, feature for any pilot worth his salt is the wristwatch. Now, unlike today's wristwatches, Watches back then weren't big affairs with lots of dials and chronographs and all of that nonsense. They were a simple um, Swiss movement or like this one, and that would enable them to hack their watches at the pilot's brief so that everything from that point forward for the rest of the day for that mission would be coordinated. And that's things like um, start engine time, taxi time, um, takeoff time, and then throughout the rest of the day until they return to their home unit. So that was the standard uniform worn by officers day to day when they weren't flying. But what did they wear when they were getting ready for a mission, when they were going to be airborne for you know anywhere between four and six hours escorting the B-17s to Berlin and back? Well, that kind of varied. And what do I mean by that? Well, for those fighter pilots from America who started the war before America's official entry into the war, they flew either with the Royal Canadian Air Force or with the Royal Air Force as part of the Eagle Squadrons, for the most part. And they would have access to the full range of Royal Air Force flying clothing and equipment. But as the war progressed and more um, complete units from America after their entry into the war in 1941, they would then move over as whole groups and they wouldn't have access to that Royal Air Force gear. So what I'm going to show you today is predominantly equipment as used by American fighter pilots from American groups that would have come from the US. Um, but there's plenty of photos out there showing uh, fighter pilots, especially from groups like the 4th Fighter Group, the 56th Fighter Group and the 78th Fighter Group, some of the, the, the very first fighter groups in the UK from the US. They'd be wearing 1941 pattern May Wests, having uh, E and G type oxygen masks, but fitted with American comms uh, for the microphone and for the headset. They'd also be wearing C -type, flying, um, C type flying helmets, which was an RAF flying helmet, and then worn with 
flying goggles from the Royal Air Force, as well as say 1936 pattern flying boots or 1943 pattern escape boots that were designed and issued to Royal Air Force crews. One um, thing that I do have on my uniform though is this Acme Thunderer and it's an Air Ministry issued whistle and that was used by crews kept on their jackets so that if they had to ditch in say the Channel or God forbid the North Sea and they needed to try and summon help that was nearby they could have this whistle on their person to call them over and this was done by both American crews and Royal Air Force crews as well you often see it on their um, jackets the uh, the blue jackets worn by Royal Air Force air crew. So, kitting up for a mission then this would be done inside of the squadron um, equipment rooms and locker rooms that they had on board base it wouldn't typically be done outside here on the aircraft but we'll make an exception for today so first of all this is the b3 life preserver and this was the first mainstream life preserver used by um, United States Army Air Force crews, as well as paratroopers as well, especially um, during the invasions of Sicily and Italy, you would see the paratroopers of the 82nd wear these. Um, there's a few cool design features on these. So if we look behind here, first of all, you've got your die marker pack. Now this was designed so that if you landed in the sea, you could rip this flap down and it would disperse a chemical into the water around you so that any circling aircraft above, um, such as Air Sea Rescue, would be able to see your position quite clearly because it'd be this massive pool of um, like yellowy green dye in the water around you and they would know your position, they'd be able to land and then come and pick you up. Moving on down, to activate the life preserver, there were CO2 cartridges on either side and these would be activated simply by pulling down these toggles one on either side and it would then inflate the bladder inside this may west um may west from the popular actress of the 1940s and for those of you that don't know why these were called may wests um stick it into google if your um life preserver would then start to deflate while you're in the water start to lose air pressure for whatever reason you had these top-up valves as well so you could inflate the front and rear bladder they're on both sides. And then this B3, interestingly, is dated 1943, August 1943, but it's got the modification used um, there. And these were done locally by adding this back strap. And basically all that did was it just made the life preserver more secure on the body, um, which was a development that they then included on the next variant of these on the, um, on the next life preserver that came down the line. So we'll go ahead and stick this on. Right, so you may have noticed I've actually switched into my B10 jacket. This was the jacket that I mentioned earlier that um, started to become more and more prevalent as the war went on, as the A2 kind of became phased out. Um, and I've done that because it's May 2023 and it is freezing cold out here. It's about nine degrees Celsius. So I wanted something warmer. Right, so the next part of um, vital equipment that any pilot needs is a parachute. Clearly it's the one bit of equipment that no pilot ever wants to use um, but obviously skies above occupied Europe were a dangerous place to be. You've got flak, enemy fighters as well as malfunctions that could happen with the aircraft, just mechanical ones um, which would cause the pilot to have to depart the aircraft rather unexpectedly um, and in a not very nice manner. So the parachute that I've got here is the B8 parachute and it's a backpack type parachute. So one that's maybe more familiar with say the airborne forces um, or, a, or a modern day skydiver. A um, Couple of interesting features. Um, this came about late 43, um, replaced the B7, which was quite an uncomfortable parachute. This one had a, a better back panel that enabled it to be more molded to the user. So it became quite comfortable. Um, just here is the, it's a first pattern, first aid pack and um, that was there in case after bailing out that the pilot needed to provide himself with some first aid treatment so in there there'd be bandage and a couple of other assortments um, and looking at the parachute itself it's got the snap across the chest and then two leg straps which come up on under the leg and then on the back 
you've got this steel cable which comes down um, there's a series of pins in there and then upon pulling the D cord with your right handle uh, with your right hand sorry that would then pull the um, like securing pin all the way out and the bungees would then pop the um, back panel open enabling the parachute itself to come out and then um, develop overhead and you'd just be hanging there in your risers until you hit the ground. So let's get this one on now. Putting this on. Okay, so now I've got my B8 um, parachute fitted and you can see that I just spin around. You can see what it looks like when it's actually fitted. And you see there the fastening across the chest and that um, big red D handle there if I ever needed to use it in an emergency. So the final part would be the flying helmet. Now it's not like today's flying helmets where they're a big um, bone dome that you see in Top Gun or in documentaries where it's, a, it's almost like a crash helmet. Um, back then they were just simple leather helmets but they, they held the um, communication system so you'd have your earpieces to receive messages and then your oxygen mask. Like with today's oxygen masks you would have your microphone in there to enable you to communicate with your ground controller and your wingmen whilst in flight. So I will put that on next. Right, so that's the final part of the flying equipment needed to go flying in a P-51 in World War II. So this helmet that I'm wearing is an A-11 flying helmet. And this was the standard issue um, United States Army Air Force flying helmet issued to the majority of pilots. As I said, you'd see some wearing the Royal Air Force C-type flying helmet, but the A-11 is the most common place. Next, we've got the A14 oxygen mask. It's all rubber, um, big thick green tube that would connect to the oxygen supply on the aircraft and you'd have enough to get you to Berlin and back, hopefully. And then you've got your microphone lead. Now, this has got a T44 microphone fitted to this particular oxygen mask. And this was the uh, Royal Air Force type bell plug. Um, a lot of pilots use these, um, but more commonly was the standard issue American comms, but you know, you do see these crop up in photos. And then for my flying goggles, these are actually Royal Air Force Mark VII flying goggles. Again, so it was really common um, throughout the majority of the war, um, post the Battle of Britain era into um, Normandy time, when you see the very iconic Mark VIII goggles start to make an appearance. Um, there were American goggles, and again, lots of pilots wore American goggles, um, but there are again lots of photos of fighter pilots from the United States Army Air Force in the 8th Air Force specifically that would have Royal Air Force flying goggles and I can only assume they got these either through um, trades with Royal Air Force pilots training in the United States or if they visited Royal Air Force bases back in the UK or likewise if RAF pilots visited um, USAF bases they would trade equipment and um, just because it was cool and it was their mark of, or their way of being individual and as a citizen soldier within a conscript army, um, it set them apart from their peers. So it was a way of them showing their unique identity, which I think is really cool. So one other piece of flying equipment that pilots could wear, um, and is often seen photographs, um, is flying boots. Now these are the British 1943 pattern escape boots. So called because you had this suede part here, the upper, and then the leather lower which was like a regular shoe so if you had to bail out over enemy territory you would take the little knife that was in top of the uh, uh, suede part pull it out and then you could cut at the seam part there and then you would have a pair of civilian style shoes with which to make your way to Switzerland or to get in touch with the French resistance and get back to Blighty but the only problem with that was the shoes were of such good quality a lot of um, Europeans back then because of the war and, and the, the privations that they were under with the conditions 
their shoes didn't look as good. So it did unfortunately cause some issues for some pilots and set them apart. Okay, so I hope you've all enjoyed this episode all about what a P-51 pilot would wear in the United States Army Air Force in World War II. If you have, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already and the notification bell so you get notified of every new episode. And stick around because I've got more episodes on my channel all about this amazing P-51 Mustang here at Degerfeld in Germany. Okay, I'll see you all in the next one.